Good afternoon. Uh, first, let me say thank you to the organizers. Oh, they're all gone. Uh, <laughs> uh, for uh, hosting uh, this uh, event here this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I visited here not too long ago. And we had a workshop here, so I came to discuss, as usual, agricultural issues. So, as you have seen in all this nexus, um, obviously there's climate change, environment, health. Agriculture is also um, part of this game. And I have somebody very special here, I just noticed. Um, and I think that uh, when it comes to uh, rights, and a, 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 a rights approach, what about rights to food? And I think that we need to look at the whole uh, business of the issue of agriculture, the way we produce, what we actually do on the negative side, and what we do on the positive side, um, and take it maybe from an approach also uh, of the, the, uh, the uh, human rights approach, right uh, to food. Clearly there's a big connection, as you probably all know and realize, between the way we produce our food and climate change. And actually, if you look at the numbers, agriculture and the food system, the industrial agriculture and the, the developed country food system produce a, a near half, with less 47 to 55 percent, of the greenhouse gases. So you can ask yourself, how long can you do that? And um, uh, it's clearly in developing countries, it's, it's less. But they have another problem there because their type of agriculture, the more traditional one, is not devoid of also a creating problem in terms of climate change and mostly because of uh, the uh, forest cutting down, burning, um, and also certain type of agriculture which are also not exactly uh, sustainable, at least not yet. So clearly we need to make a change in this whole system. Uh, would it be just because, not only because of the climate change, but the climate change impact on health? and also the way we grow our food, which impacts climate change and impacts health, because that type of food is actually also uh, not really good. So actually, if we wanted to solve the climate change uh, problem, and I think we could do a whole lot more than we do today, um, we could deal with two things, the human health, the environmental health, and on the environmental health, I'm thinking also about climate change. And uh, the Rodel uh, scientists have calculated, and the, there's a little uh, YouTube video you can, you can look, uh, look at, uh, which uh, says that if we were to, tomorrow, decide that global scale, we move on to organic, agroecological agriculture, we would absorb back into the soil sequestered one and a half times the annual production of CO2. So, you know, if you want to do something, we could actually say, all right, this is the rule as of tomorrow, or say January 1st, since that's also the start of the SDGs, why don't we just change the way we do agriculture? And so we would not only actually stop being part of the problem, but we could become a big part of the solution. And I think that that's what agriculture needs to be. Agriculture needs to become part of the solution of climate change. And also we need to become a much, much larger part of uh, the solution of, of the general environment we live in uh, and also on our, of our uh, health. Just think about you know, what sort of the impact of our industrial agriculture model have been. Again, we can go away even from the climate change issue, we can look at uh, the food which is produced through that system. The quality, for example. It's a lot of quantity, it's very little quality. And um, we need to change this. There's enough evidence, there's a lot of uh, peer-reviewed publication which show the difference in quality between uh, organic food versus conventional food. Now sure, a lot of people will deny all this, that this is in people's heads. Sure, if you go and ask people what tastes better, taste is, a, is an individual issue. But if you start to analyze what's in those uh, uh, crops, in those food, very different matter altogether because you can show that they are more, nutri they are more, they are more nutritious, there's more car element, vitamins, antioxidants, uh, they would have longer shelf lives. So these are all facts which I think again and also these deniers on the other side um, um, continue to say so, but I think the facts are there and I think talk and, and uh, give enough ammunition I think to a lot of people to say we need a, a, a major change. Now what is another big problem for almost every politician in the world? Jobs. Let me look at the whole migration issue. 
And uh, if these people had jobs in agriculture, if the land wouldn't be taken away from them, if, it be, if the price system would be so that they are not suffering under say, the cheap imports, because their local politicians, rather than help the local farming system uh, import cheap food, um, we wouldn't be in the situation of all these millions of people trying to go away from home. They would not leave home either if there wouldn't be climate change impact, because we already know impact in many areas, uh, people can't do anything anymore because of the situation uh, which is partly due to climate change, you know, short or long term, but the facts are people are moving. If you have no, you have no job, you have no food, you have no land, what are you going to do? I mean, this, 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 the situation is hopeless. I mean, to think, think about these people, not all, but many people who come across the Sahara, um, to take a chance on your life, you know, the, the chance of survival is not less than 50-50. I mean, just think about lately how many people died just crossing the, the Mediterranean. Never mind the ones who disappear already, just, you know, between where they left in Sierra Leone or uh, in Nigeria or in Mali or in Senegal, for example, until they only reach the boat. Never mind what the boat trip is. So people are totally desperate. And I think a lot has to do with our systems of agriculture. <laughs> what have we actually done in helping in developing countries, the, the agricultural system to, to change, to become a positive force in the development of these countries. Uh, very little. As you know, even the EU, under the new uh, cap, has planned surplus production. On a global scale, and you hear it later on, later on again from a uh, uh, colleague, uh, uh, Francis Morlape, we produce way more than we need today, on a global scale. Um, actually, the numbers are your publication 2011 are 4,600 calories per day per person. That's exactly double what we need to be healthy. It's not only calories, actually. I think we need to avoid nutrition. And Vandana Shiva, which probably many of you know, actually has a publication, you can go look at the Vandana, which says um, health per acre, not yield per acre. And that's, that's a very nice way of putting it. Because today, our modern agriculture produces calories, empty calories. That's why we have the obesity issue, that's why we have a lot of the, this gluten uh, intolerance issue, we have diabetes type 2 issues. So all these things are accumulating over. And basically, you can trace it back to the way we grow our food, to the way we've done research to always maximize yield, but not looking at all the other part of nutrition, I think, which we should have been looking at and pay more attention to. So again, you know, we, so we have so much evidence. I mean, the, every day is new stuff coming out. But every day we have to fight more because the other side, those vested interests who produce hybrid and GMO seeds, <coughs> who produce the pesticides, who produce uh, the, the fertilizer, will come and crush you say, no, that evidence is not good enough, give me more evidence. It's always more. And uh, I must say that, you know, for having spent my life in science, and that's why I have someone now, I quit this a little bit and move on to the policy, uh, because I think we need to tackle the problem also from another end. And clearly, just with scientific papers, you can't really make the shift. I mean, again, we have plenty of evidence, and it seems that it's still never enough uh, to convince those policy makers. So I think that it's time that we, we look at, okay, how and where else can we apply the lever to make the change? Um, and I believe, and you know the discussion going on right now, again, about around the uh, climate change issues, you know, we are, we are reaching, you know, really a, a point of no return, almost. The two degrees, we can forget about it, and I just learned that there is a whole <coughs> team of people are, you know, meeting in Washington over the Arctic. I mean, again, there's a lot of articles out there right now saying that what's happening up there right now, as we hear from Europe, guys, okay, uh, it, it is, is um, irreversible. And it's really dramatic. Um, what's going to happen because of not only the, the ice melting, but the, the indirect effect of, of all this is all the methane, which is the pouring out of those areas which were nicely covered up in the past. And this is mega, this is huge. The, you can, the, the only cars in the world will never produce enough you know, or more or uh, uh, the same amount of uh, greenhouse gases as this methane, which is leaking out. So to me, it looks like. Um, we're late in the day, but you know, I'm an optimist, I hope we're all optimistic that if we were to actually to start to do something, we could. And I think that we, in agriculture in particular, in our food system, we can make a huge contribution 
and I think we, we cannot miss uh, the opportunity, I think, to, to, to do it. And that's why we have to take Monsanto to court for, for crimes against humanity, and we will do so next year in The Hague, in June and in May, where we are mounting a whole tribunal there. Um, maybe there will be Monsanto and Syngenta together if they manage to merge until then, which is good because then we make two out of one, um, so that's even better. So I think we, we need set examples. We cannot be held uh, uh, hostage by those companies, by those interests. And uh, although I won't see the world for much longer, but I think a lot of people and young people like in this room, uh, this will affect you uh, really greatly, and uh, we all know. So I think time uh, is the time we need to, to move uh, forward. And I think my last uh, word here today will be about the opportunity, which is a total unique opportunity we have right now, is with the system of development goals. If we miss that opportunity to really implement what is, what is in there, and even go beyond, because I think every country will have to decide what the targets are. They are not decided. We have, we, well, although we have a goal, 17 and 169 targets, the, the details of targets will vary according to the country. So there's a big job there to be done by each country to see how are they going to meet somehow sort of an average uh, of those of those uh, uh, targets. And um, depending on what country, I mean, my own country, Switzerland, we won't have to deal too much about poverty, but I think we have a lot to do with emissions. And, and for example, for, just for example, in Botswana, maybe a bit different. So that's why there's not one recipe for everybody. And what decisions will be made, first of all, in September 15th uh, in, uh, in New York, and what the countries will do individually uh, after that is going to be really, I think, uh, most important. And I think that um, at least for the agriculture uh, set up, anything has to do with food, and you know there's a number of goals and targets relate, which relate to food, I think um, we know already what to do and hope we can implement these things uh, um, as soon as January 1st comes. But we need going to need a roadmap which needs to be set up. Uh, then we need to make sure there's a monitoring system in place. Because if that's not there, you know, everybody's just going to do whatever they want. We have to monitor and review and report back. And I think a lot of countries right now are very unhappy about having to report because this is not only affecting the developing countries, the same rules will apply to everybody. And actually, I wonder what's going to happen in this country. I wonder what's going to happen in my own country. How are they going to handle this? But I think that we as scientists, huh, turning the hat again the other way, I think we need to push and say, hey guys, you policymakers need science to inform the policies and not the politics. Thank you.